Morandi and I'm going to tell you why Leonardo da Vinci is important today in a World AI Can Festival. I think that all of you, you know Leonardo da Vinci. It was a great artist and a scientist. Why is important today, <coughs> and the title of this speech with the important people that are going talking to you, is why shaping the future, Leonardo da Vinci can give us some guideline to shape the future of artificial intelligence. I want to let you see phrases that he pronounced. And you can look at these phrases and in your actual work, are you programmer, scientist, teacher, even political people, think about these phrases and check if these phrases apply to your work. So Leonardo, as you know him, was not uh, a cultivated man. In this time, <coughs> there was not the NA, the CNRS, or some study in Oxford or Stanford, but at this time, someone that want to be uh, educated should learn Greek, Latin, <coughs> and mathematics, and Greek philosophy. He didn't learn any of them. And he was sent, when he was 10 years old, from his father, father <coughs> sorry, I got a cold because of this weather. <coughs> and for, was he sent to practice art at 10 years old in the, in the famous studio of Verrocchio, as he very soon bypassed in art his master. Leonardo so has not a classical education on his time. That's why for him, art and science, because he was a scientist, was a very methodological a scientist man. He uh, looked, uh, when he was painting on designing something, he was always looking and try to understand the model that was behind the appearances. That's the systematic, systemic, sorry, work that we do now. Science now, don't look at what is appearing, but look beyond this, what could be the model and the understanding of what there is not shown by reality. This is one of the first phrases that Leonardo pronounced. Please, I think it's a phrase that can apply today in our world. Today we have a specialized um, subject. Each one is very strong, is in its own field. And all these fields, sometimes they don't talk to each other. And this could be a problem. For him, we can pass in the next slide. <clears throat> For him, art was the better way to understand what was going on and understand this world. When we say art, we say, we say art for Leonardo da Vinci, it was uh, designing not only the body of a human being, and it was very clever to do it. Uh, not only this, he designed plants, insect, even a drop of water. All of them in the same page sometime. And that's why he didn't give more importance to the human being in this world. An insect has the same respect and right of life, let's say, that a person. So if you think about nowadays how mankind are using nature and what is going on in an ecological point of view, we can understand effectively this, uh, this uh, respect that Leonardo da Vinci had for nature. Sometimes he said that humans, they make invention that are better in nature and they are more expensive. Think about how many times we change our phone or we do uh, a lot of useless invention. He was always looking nature, we can learn from nature. So he designed also machine and machinery that were not in this uh, 
design is time, created by, by men. But uh, it has always uh, this idea that if you look in the nature, we can learn. We can go in the next one, and I will pass my micro to the other people. Today, he was able to describe, not imagining, not uh, writing, not dreaming. He was able to describe the future. And we are talking here about shaping the future of AI. You will meet during these two days of conferences a lot of uh, technological people, all the new idea from uh, uh, big data or type of software that is new. Today, there is every day a new announcement about progress in artificial progress, new things coming on in artificial intelligence. And, uh, <clears throat> but all of them, if you ask all the people that are specialists in different fields, they don't know what the future of technology in artificial intelligence will be. They don't know, all of them don't know. So Leonardo was able to, able, sorry, to have a vision about uh, technology even before this existed. That's why we will have uh, the, the codex of fly, that, that's why flight. Then we have other codex uh, that describe a different type of uh, uh, invention that came later uh, because technology was not a, a, available at this moment. But this fact that he was, could be able to describe the future, even if he didn't see it, is a good uh, lesson for all of us. So what we can, uh, before passing my microphone to all our speakers, what we can uh, keep in mind uh, today about Leonardo da Vinci. He has an holistic uh, vision of science. Holistic means we are all together, things are connected all together, so we don't need, we don't, it's dangerous even to work and to develop technology without thinking that is complex and is unique. So talking between different type of sciences, different type of invention, and different type even in, of knowledge. And I will pass the board of my, of my right professor on my left, <laughs> my left, Professor Florent Aziomanov, that is going to tell you about the living Mona Lisa. Everyone knows it, but the living Mona Lisa is going to be explained by Professor Azimov. Thank you. Bonsoir. Euh, je vous remercie à tous d'être ici. Je remercie le festival de cette invitation à présenter la Living Mona Lisa et d'avoir organisé cette conférence, et en particulier Diana Landi, qui a fait un travail formidable de nous réunir pour pouvoir vous présenter euh, tous ces travaux. Euh, donc moi, effectivement, je vais vous dire quelques mots dans la poursuite de ce que vient d'exposer euh, Diana, euh, de placer effectivement l'intelligence artificielle dans la perspective de, de la Renaissance, en parlant d'une nouvelle Renaissance, dans le sens où euh, eh bien, ces nouveaux outils, dont on constate qu'ils sont de plus en plus puissants, probablement vont nous ouvrir à de nouvelles compréhensions de ce que c'est d'être au monde aujourd'hui et de l'action qu'on peut y conduire. C'est dans ce sens-là, et je donnerai l'exemple euh, comme un case study de euh, la Living Mona Lisa, en effet. Donc la question que je me suis posée depuis le début, c'est euh, que euh, si quelque chose de nouveau peut nous arriver comme système d'expression, ça peut conduire jusqu'à une nouvelle discipline d'expression. De la même manière que la technique de l'image animée, qui a été, euh, quand elle a été inventée, n'a pas tout de suite donné lieu à l'invention du cinéma comme discipline d'expression, il a fallu un certain temps, quelques décennies, avant que le cinéma émerge. Donc, pour ça, il fallait trouver la spécificité. J'ai parlé de cinéma. Le cinéma n'est pas un art de l'image. Le cinéma, c'est un art du temps qui passe. Et il a fallu une quarantaine d'années pour comprendre qu'il y avait un déplacement 
comme ça, dans une nouvelle discipline d'expression, et que pour la première fois, on pouvait manipuler le temps, et que c'était via cette manipulation qu'on allait s'exprimer. Qu et c'est là ce que j'ai cherché à comprendre. Y a-t-il une nouvelle manière de s'exprimer quand on utilise l'intelligence artificielle Bon, pour ça, il faut revenir un peu aux fondamentaux, qui sont assez simples. Quand on veut s'exprimer, on a quelqu'un, un auteur, a quelque chose dans son esprit et il espère le transmettre le plus à l'identique possible dans l'esprit de quelqu'un d'autre. Alors évidemment, euh, bon, on peut expliquer, mais les artistes veulent transmettre des choses qu'ils ne peuvent pas expliquer. Plein de gens veulent d'ailleurs transmettre des choses qu'ils n'arrivent pas à expliquer. Et dans quel cas, comment on fait On ne peut pas le faire avec la télépathie, ça, ça ne fonctionne pas. Donc, la manière dont on procède, tout simplement, c'est qu'on réalise une manifestation dans le réel, qu'on va appeler pour les artistes une œuvre d'art. Ça peut être une danse, un chant, ça peut être une image, ça peut être un film, peu importe, mais on va réaliser une manifestation dans le réel qui, vous le voyez, du coup, va pouvoir être reçu par le spectateur et cette réception, ça va provoquer une projection psychologique. Je vous montre une jolie image de pâquerette et hop, l'idée de la tendresse vient dans votre épris. C'est ça, la projection psychologique, quand c'est bien fait et c'est peut-être pas bien fait, là, en l'occurrence. Euh, nous, dans notre cas, on utilise du matériel numérique. Donc, on a un ordinateur, on a de l'image de synthèse, des choses comme ça pour s'exprimer, on a plein de capteurs. Et grâce à ça, on va pouvoir donner un comportement à notre euh, œuvre d'art. Puisque l'œuvre d'art a un comportement, elle va pouvoir établir une relation avec le spectateur. Ça, c'est vraiment la caractéristique opérationnelle, technique, factuelle de ce que l'on fait avec les choses numériques. Mais si je peux avoir une relation avec le spectateur, alors ce qu'il se passe, c'est que j'anime le comportement du spectateur. Je vous donne un exemple. Vous avez ici quelque chose qui a été présenté de nombreuses fois, et entre autres ici à la Expo de Shanghai en 2010, une œuvre qui a été créée, donc, que j'ai produite en 2008, pour une artiste qui s'appelle Catherine Langlade. Et cette image, en fait, elle, les gens comprennent qu'elle réagisse à la présence du spectateur, mais en fait, le comportement de l'image va conduire petit à petit les gens à explorer ce qui est positif à faire avec et finalement se mettre à danser. Parce qu'en fait, Catherine Anglaise n'est pas, pas une plasticienne, c'est une chorégraphe, et ce qui l'intéresse, c'est de faire danser les gens d'une certaine manière. Et là, elle le fait, vous voyez, à travers le comportement même du spectateur. Donc, vous voyez que c'est ici la nouvelle modalité d'expression, la nouvelle discipline d'expression. Je m'exprime à travers le comportement du spectateur que j'ai pu animer par le comportement de l'œuvre via la relation. C'est ça le mécanisme qu'on doit faire. On le fait dans l'art quand on utilise l'intelligence artificielle, mais les gens qui utilisent l'IA, que ce soit dans les services, que ce soit dans la communication, sont exactement dans le même mécanisme d'expression. Voilà. Alors, Bon, ici, je vous l'ai fait très bref, c'est décrit de manière beaucoup plus longue dans les livres que j'ai publiés et euh, qui rentrent dans, évidemment beaucoup plus dans le détail de cette élaboration conceptuelle. Donc, ce que vous voyez, c'est qu'on a une nouvelle discipline d'expression. Effectivement, je m'exprime à travers le, le, ce que, euh, le, le comportement du spectateur, à travers son état d'esprit. Et je vais prendre l'exemple de la Joconde, parce qu'en vérité, la Mona Lisa, parce qu'en vérité, Leonardo da Vinci, avec... La, comme Diana l'a introduit déjà, dans un système visionnaire, Leonardo euh, a fait euh, quelque chose de cet ordre-là avec Mona Lisa. Euh, Leonardo, bon, c'est la figure majeure de la Renaissance, comme on le sait, et surtout, c'est un très grand peintre. Et la peinture, à cette époque, ce n'était pas bon, ben, un truc que je peux faire en plus, c'est sympa, je sais bien peindre. La peinture, c'était l'activité ultime à l'époque pour exprimer notamment sa conception du monde, ce que l'on avait compris, ce que l'on voulait euh, exprimer. Et c'était un exceptionnel euh, portraitiste. Et par rapport au portrait, précisément, ce qu'il disait, c'est bon, un bon peintre, il doit exprimer deux choses, le modèle et son état d'esprit. Et pour lui, il disait, le premier, c'est facile, bon, pour lui, peut-être, mais le second, c'est difficile. Il se rendait compte que le second, c'était très difficile. Et je, je pense qu'il a eu l'intuition, en fait, euh, que il devait utiliser l'état d'esprit de son spectateur pour arriver à rendre encore plus vivant le modèle que le spectateur était en train de regarder. Alors, la Mona Lisa, la voilà, et euh, la manière dont elle se présente, a priori et simplement, c'est une jeune femme, tout à fait ordinaire, devant un paysage, lui également tout à fait ordinaire, de Toscane. Rien ne permet d'identifier cette jeune femme, elle n'est pas connue, ce n'est pas la Vierge Marie, ce n'est pas une princesse qu'on peut admirer ou craindre, etc., etc. Et en fait, alors, 
à partir de là, démarre une conférence qui dure deux heures. Là, Diana m'a dit non, ce n'est pas possible. Donc, je vais passer directement à la conclusion euh, et de dire, <coughs> je ne vais pas rentrer dans les détails, mais ce que je vais vous dire s'appuie sur une, une analyse très détaillée de l'œuvre. De dire, donc, Leonardo, il a créé un portrait d'une personne, d'une certaine manière, qui est vide. Elle n'a pas d'histoire, elle ne s'impose pas à nous. Et donc, puisqu'elle est comme vide, on doit se projeter nous-mêmes dans le tableau. Hein, il y a l'espace pour que moi-même, je me projette dans ce personnage. Mais par ailleurs, il a mis plein de choses très euh, comment dire, perturbantes dans le tableau et qu'il va utiliser pour canaliser notre état d'esprit. Comment C'est la fameuse conférence de deux heures que je ne fais pas. Mais au final, ça fait quoi C'est qu'il peut transmettre dans l'état d'esprit du spectateur, en utilisant vraiment son, le, le, le comportement et la relation, le fait que le sujet qui l'intéresse, c'est la curiosité, l'ouverture d'esprit et la rigueur, que c'est sa position qu'il avait dans la vie, et c'est ce qu'il attend du spectateur qui regarde la Joconde, et il essaye de le placer dans cet état d'esprit. Et que moi, donc, j'essaye de poursuivre, avec la Living Mona Lisa, de, qui doit transmettre les mêmes enjeux. Donc ici, je vous montre une vidéo, je ne sais pas si vous avez eu le temps de passer à l'exposition, vous pouvez la voir dans la relation. Bon, là, ce n'est pas une relation, c'est une vidéo qui passe, mais euh, la question... Ici, un tout petit peu d'ouvrir le capot de la machine, vous dire comment c'est fait, quelque chose, une œuvre de ce type-là. Eh bien, en l'occurrence, la manière dont on structure assez simplement les, les œuvres de Living Art, ce que moi donc j'appelle le Living Art, c'est qu'on a un système de perception, un système de comportement et un système d'expression. Ce qui est intéressant, le fait de distinguer perception, comportement, expression, c'est qu'on ne met pas le lien direct entre la perception et l'expression, du genre « je fais ça, ça fait ça ». Non, je, « je, je, le spectateur, fait ça », et ben le comportement va décider qu'il en tient compte ou pas, qu'il en tient compte de telle manière, et ce que ça va répondre, ce sera ce qu'en fait l'œuvre, et non pas ce que moi, spectateur, j'en ai fait. Plus concrètement, pour la Living Mona Lisa, et très rapidement, pour ce qui est de la perception, on a simulé de, des, des neurotransmetteurs virtuels, l'adrénaline, dopamine, sérotonine, donc ce qu'il se passe a un effet émotionnel sur la Joconde. Son comportement, sa personnalité virtuelle a été engrammée dans un réseau de neurones et on a créé un langage virtuel qu'on a mis sur un modèle 3D, dont je vous fais tourner une petite vidéo. C'était les tout premiers essais qu'on a fait et qu'on n'a pas conservé, d'ailleurs en l'occurrence, mais qui vous montre ce que ça veut dire de donner un langage, virtu... un langage corporel à l'œuvre. Et tout ça est réglé de telle manière qu'on l'espère, euh, cela transmet effectivement les enjeux de curiosité, d'ouverture et de rigueur. Hein, C'est-à-dire que tout le comportement de la monnaie et son expression favorise ça contre tout le reste. Voilà. Pour conclure, je voudrais juste dire quelques mots qui peuvent tout, nous intéresser tous et que je situe aussi dans la perspective de ce qu'a dit euh, Diana, qui est comment ça se passe quand on pense entre intelligence et digital aujourd'hui. Ben, la manière dont ça se passe, c'est qu'on pense IA. Et on se dit, on va faire une machine qui va être pleine d'IA et qui va devenir et fonctionner de mieux en mieux. Et même, elle va tellement mieux fonctionner qu'elle va fonctionner mieux que moi. Et même, finalement, elle n'aura même plus besoin de moi, je vais disparaître. Et ça, ça s'appelle Matrix. Mais il y a une autre manière de considérer la chose, qui est de dire, je vais faire effectivement tout un tas de choses avec le numérique. Hein, tout ce qu'on fait, on va le faire effectivement, mais pour aller vers une intelligence augmentée. Et en l'occurrence, mon intelligence augmentée. Ce qui est en jeu, c'est que mon intelligence soit augmentée par toutes ces choses-là. Bien sûr, demain, je vais être entouré, et je suis déjà, et je vais être entouré de plein de services, plein de fonctions, plein de produits, etc. etc. Mais pour que moi, je puisse en tirer un bénéfice personnel, il faut que ça soit situé plutôt dans une ambiance, dans un système d'intelligence ambiante. Si tout autour de moi m'aide à être mieux intelligent, il y a des chances que ça se produise, plutôt que si je suis, j'ai à lutter contre un robot, que j'essaye de rester aussi intelligent que lui. Donc si je résume, l'intelligence artificielle, eh ben, il vaut peut-être mieux parler de mon intelligence augmentée, hein, c'est les mêmes technos hein, en vérité, mais dans, situé dans une autre perspective, mon intelligence augmentée, pour ça il faut générer des systèmes d'intelligence ambiante, ce que ça veut dire, c'est qu'il faut qu'il y ait euh, dans ces choses qui m'entourent des services qui collaborent entre eux, et non pas qu'ils sont dans leur silo et qu'ils essayent d'être juste meilleurs que les autres pour pouvoir les écraser les autres, mais ils doivent collaborer entre eux pour arriver à faire en sorte que, effectivement, moi-même, je puisse, comme Leonardo avait voulu le faire, être mieux capable d'être curieux, ouvert sur le monde, avec rigueur. Voilà, je vous remercie pour votre écoute.
as you might have seen uh, downstairs in the exhibition hall. Oh, here I can see that one. Uh, I am presenting here uh, a very uh, known piece of art of Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, this time I tried to put together the genius of Leonardo. Let me see here if the button works fine. Uh, and to speak not about the part that we all know about the Last Supper, but so I put here some phrases of some of my colleagues that I am here. Leonardo da Vinci had a big fascination with the intersection of the natural and the mechanical. He would have loved to be able to use the facilities we have developed nowadays. He would have loved artificial intelligence. So uh, this is uh, uh, a quote by Galuzzi, which is the director of the Museum of Galilei in Florence. So uh, this is also one of the motifs that I choose to work on Leonardo's thematic, because he was inspiring me a lot in what to do and how to do, and I learned out a lot of things because I, will, I did this work in honor to him to uh, start a viewpoint and using new technologies, if he would be here nowadays, how he would have approached the idea of making the Last Supper. So Leonardo exhibited uh, already 500 years ago all the alike, i.e. like ability to debate, debate himself and to complete with himself. So this is very important because usually we are not doing it. So the brain power machines have that human lux and neuroscientist Moran Serif mentioned that a computer can compete with itself and learn from. So this is also very important. And he said the computer program that uh, then less, okay, the, here's something mistaken on the PowerPoint, whatever, uh, less than how to become a greater game. So the computer learns out of when he has the manuals, how to do, he learns. And we don't have the capacity, we have to do practice uh, on, to learn on this. And so Leonardo had the capacity to uh, learn and to criticize himself. Oh, the big one. Okay. Yeah, the, the PowerPoint is totally out of the thing. So maybe I'm working in a higher resolution than the things. So to, dis to discover, explore through medium, he knows best. So Leonardo da Vinci, he was a very good drawer. He draws a lot of things. And so he made, uh, like nowadays we are using in the artificial intelligence, we are basically sliding through a lot of images mm -hmm. to find uh, so our intelligence of the computers, they are basically searching for the right answer for the, what you are asking for and give you then the result and give you a sort of the uh, maximum uh, output of what it comes. So Leonardo da Vinci made the same thing in his way, in a manual and in a human way, because when he did analyze something, he looked at the, and explored the object, the nature, the behavior of nature, and he made a lot of drawings out of it to become familiar. Uh, with the object or whatever it is. And then he made uh, a lot of mechanisms he developed and he invented a lot of machineries uh, that he tried to make things move and make things uh, appear in the way. So here, what we are doing here in the Last Supper, I was trying to put together uh, the different viewpoints that we have in the Last Supper. So when we look at the Last Supper, when you have the chance to go to Milano to see the Last Supper, you are eight meters in distance to the Last Supper wall, so where is the painting, and you are down on the ground level, while Leonardo has basically made the horizon line on four meter fifty height. So he had to trick the vision and the optical illusion to the visitor. So he tilted the image and he turned it down as we do nowadays in the holographical representation using Pepper's Ghost. And so basically this is for me already a representation that Leonardo da Vinci, back 500 years, he made already the hologram in its way in a B-dimensional layer. So what we are doing here, for example, just I show you just the image that we have here. We have a gigapixel image of the Last Supper, which is done out of, I show you after the next slide, of 1,000 and more images stitched together. And we have the capacity in 8K to project here the red point uh, onto the screen of the whatever we have. Now we are presenting this in as a virtual reality space into a 16 meters by 9 meter a dimension screen, front projection and ground projection in stereoscopical view, and the users and the visitors have glasses to polarize the stereoscopical and they can feel totally inside. So we can uh, explain exactly the, the idea of how uh, the concept of the 
perspective has been developed. Here you can see that the image has been stitched by a lot of images, and this is uh, the, the image I'm using, so we have capacities to go very close to the image, and we make it very short. But the importance of the painting is not the religious part, is not the painting itself in its way. He was for the first time able as an artist to do in the 15th century to bring together the gaze, the movement of the hands and the emotion. So he basically produced a freeze frame of the moment into the painting, putting together with the perspective, and that makes the illusion of what is the painting. Here we, I show, for example, uh, to put uh, this project together, speaking about Leonardo da Vinci, I didn't want only to speak about the painting, but I want to speak how the painting has evolved because it has been commissioned to, to him, uh, giving the order that you have to put it in diagonal to the church if, uh, in Milano, Santa Maria delle Grazie, which is located exactly there. And so we made a laser scan on the whole church to bring it into the context, and this is what uh, you said before, we have to integrate different technologies, and this is also the way that I try to bring together different disciplines and different practices that we are using nowadays, technology and the media. And so I put together high resolution images, I put together point clouds that are made in a different way, put them in virtual reality, three-dimensional way, interactive, and then you can discover anything in different ways. What we are showing here, we are having a fragment of the what in virtual reality you can do. So here we have developed also the Theorema, which is the tool that we are using that you can uh, prove and measure exactly the perspective that Leonardo has used. And so this is this grid that depending on the inclination of what you're doing, you can see. And here you see the distortion in the right down of the painting that Leonardo da Vinci made. So if we would look into the virtual room that is in the back, we would see the apostles in the back in an inclination that it doesn't give that effect and this imprint of uh, image in that way. So he tilted it 45 degrees in front, and this is what how he obtains in the image the right uh, conclusion for the people. So here, for example, we prove the fact of the hologram. So I made here a test with a prisma of uh, a glass prisma. So I put it in front of a laser beam in the same position, if I put it in front of the prisma, which is the 45 degree angle tilting, the uh, laser beam beams down to the visitor, and if I take it away, it beams exactly in the horizon line of that. And this proves that Leonardo da Vinci was very able to already know all about this technique. Uh, then, uh, to make it short, I have also here the presentation of the uh, codex of Leonardo, where he makes all the studies about how to start to fly, how to look into the uh, motion of the birds, how to translate this into machineries to make possible the idea to be on air. And uh, he made all the tests and the machines have been by a colleague in Milano, he has already realized all the models and made, and they work perfectly, but uh, the failure was that he didn't calculate the manpower that is needed to fly these kind of machines. Uh, the very interesting part in this codex is that uh, it has been discovered by a scientist and historian uh, not so far ago, in 2009, that in between the writing, because we made all the uh, uh, big, uh, the gigapixel images from the book, from each page, and so we discovered there was the uh, portrait of Leonardo when he was young, and then when he was now the portrait of Elva, that matches exactly together. So this is exactly the comprobation of the thing. I made a, a, just a little game that I used artificial intelligence to put myself together in a walk with Leonardo da Vinci. He's not exactly like him. I have another project where he's coming exactly alike in the way he's in the portrait. And with this, I basically thank you very much. And uh, I hope that you can see the project. And I have the time to... If you can, please... Uh send my presentation, okay. Well, first thing, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thanks uh, to Diana Landi, to Professor Diana Landi, to have invited me here. Since uh, it is a bit late, I will uh, uh, concentrate uh, my presentation. You can find the whole thing in uh, the um, journal you can collect uh, at the Leonardo Booth uh, in uh, the exhibition. Okay, well, a few words about uh, this first part. Humans, human beings, uh, 
always uh, made the technology. Human is uh, a technological animal. Only that uh, in the ancient world, uh, well, humans uh, built things uh, before even being completely human, that is, before being self-conscious completely. But until the end of uh, ancient world, Technology was just empirical technology. And uh, people with a culture that is a philosopher, uh, literates, and so on, despised the technology because they thought that technology was just a work for slaves. Here we have uh, something that wrote uh, Seneca saying that uh, everything we can invent and build may be useful, but uh, has nothing to do with uh, our intelligence and uh, with our thinking. It's just something for slaves. Things changed uh, completely when the Greek rational world merged with Judeo-Christian spirituality at the beginning, we can say 2,000 years ago, and learned people started thinking that technology was very useful to help humans in their life. Monks thought that developing machines and developing technology, other monks had more time to pray, and so, Technology and building machines became a very important thing for the people who had the, the privilege and the opportunity to think and to be learned. Well, this you can find in the paper. St. Augustine was a fan of technology and uh, said a lot of things about uh, how nice uh, is uh, technology and how nice is the work of man. So the dream of flying was very old, but uh, flying for humans was thinked that was linked with magic in some way. Uh, mytholo mythology and magic uh, described men who were able to fly. But in the end of the Middle Ages, philosophers started thinking that it was possible to build machines to fly. And this was the turning point. And in this trend, Leonardo was fully inside. And Leonardo built, drew a lot of different machines, and he wrote a code, and we have already heard about this code, in which he studied how birds fly, because he thought that birds fly because they compress the air under their wings, and uh, this is just a physical phenomenon, and uh, humans can utilize this phenomenon to learn how to fly. And uh, his uh, codex uh, describes with a lot of details uh, and even uh, a lot of details about where must be the center of mass uh, of the bird with respect to, to the center of pressure of the air. All things that uh, we know, but uh, uh, was Leonardo who first, for the first time said. He also built the drone, he didn't build any of them, uh, machines that have no correspondence in nature. We must never forget that this idea that humans can use observation of nature to build machine is still a valid idea, but changed rapidly with Darwin. Because before Darwin, humans thought that everything that is created, all nature, was created directly by God as it is. After Darwin, even people who uh, believe in God 
started thinking that natural object developed through evolution and there was no one to design things. So the natural object were coming from experimentation and no science, no conscious being who invented them. So Leonardo thought about the helicopter, the parachute, all things that in a way compress air under them and so allow air to carry the object. So Leonardo was very modern also in that because he didn't stop in uh, imitating nature but also started thinking about uh, uh, objects that don't have a correspondence in nature. Humans at last learned how to fly, but in a completely different way, in a way that has nothing to do with birds, has nothing to do with what Leonardo thought, that is balloons. At the end of the 18th century, hot air balloon and hydrogen balloons carried the human being in the air, gave the human being the third dimension. The motion of humans before was just a two-dimensional. Now, after this, became three-dimensional. But humans went on trying to fly like a bird, and the science developed. And notice, science, as the ancient people did, that is empirical science, could not reach this level. Only scientific technology could do it. And uh, at the end, uh, well, scientific approach, and at the end, uh, flight was achieved in a way that is not very different from what Leonardo was thinking, because Leonardo observed that to fly is not important to flap your wing, that big birds fly with fixed wings, and it was exactly this way in which we fly. That is, ornithopters are still something for science fiction, who loves the saga of dunes knows that there, there are ornithopters everywhere. But in the real world, fixed wings or helicopters, and both things were something that Leonardo was, uh, we can say, promoting. But in the meantime, people learned that the atmosphere is a very thin layer around Earth. So to go to the stars, to the stars, well, to the other planets, uh, we had to go <coughs> above and beyond atmosphere. And this uh, was uh, thought and then realized in the 20th century with a lot of pioneers uh, and uh, before, well, just after the middle of the 20th century, some humans, uh, landed on the moon and demonstrated that we can work, we can walk, we can live on the moon. And this is very important. In this adventure, that is finding the way to fly and to go beyond the atmosphere, Leonardo had his role. And to honor Leonardo and this role, NASA, the director of um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory works with robotic uh, probes, uh, not with human carrying vehicles. Uh, robotic and human carrying in the States are very much divided and different organization to that. Um, under the idea of uh, Silvia Rosa Bruzin, a journalist, <coughs> had the idea of putting a copy of uh, the Leonardo self-portrait and uh, of uh, the codex uh, of, the bird of, fly, uh, of the flight of birds uh, on a chip and to put it on board 
of the Curiosity rover, the biggest rover ever built for Mars, a rover that has that had a very big success because it was designed to last a few months and it lasted, it lasted more than a decade. And, uh, well, it is still there. Okay, so Leonardo is inside that uh, spacecraft and uh, it landed uh, in, uh, the, um, in a crater that is exactly in front on Mount Sharp. This image of Mount Sharp, I like it very much because it shows you that Mars is not so different from Earth. That picture could have been taken in the painted desert on Earth, for example, or in other places, desert places, obviously, on Earth. So Leonardo is there. And we are going to have a multiplanetary future and uh, space uh, is not just for science. Space is much more for, for than science. Uh, is a notion to be crossed uh, toward places in which we humans uh, will not only work, but live, live, enjoy our lives, uh, and create uh, new civilization, civilizations, because we are going to many places beyond uh, this uh, ocean and uh, create uh, new civilizations and new art. Okay, all what I said uh, is uh, taken from these books. Uh, one is uh, a book about Mars exploration. It tells you all what uh, you wanted to ask, but you never dare to ask about how to go to Mars. The one there is about the importance of technology in the growth of civilization. And the one on the right is just a fiction. It describes how maybe, but I think it is fairly realistic, the first mission to Mars. So Mars is a place in which we don't ask whether we will go, but it's a place we can ask when we will go, because humankind is anyway going to become a multiplanetary civilization. Okay, let's see if this is working. I, I don't have slides. Okay. I don't have slides. I don't want to risk. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, my role here is to maybe moderate the question, the Q&A session, because we wanted since the very beginning to have this, uh, um, this session very interactive. But I cannot refrain myself because um, I had some notes, so I cannot refrain myself to maybe five minutes, still five minutes if I may, uh, maybe to tell you something about um, uh, all this very interesting um, conversation, and in particular regarding also my background. So I'm, I'm working on the space, space sector. So why Leonardo, AI, and, and space? Um, so bear on me. Five minutes, not, not more than that. Um, well, when I was asked to, you know, to moderate this, uh, this session, this Q&A, and, um, and also have give a thought maybe on um, the conjunction, the merging of Leonardo, AI, and space, of course, the first thing that came in my mind was uh, um, quoting or mentioning the Curiosity rover, where the Corisco flight was, uh, was there from, um, from the JPL and from, uh, uh, from Leonardo, of course. There is also a self-portrait, as Professor Genta said, on the rover, and also mentioning maybe the, the new uh, mission that is called the Da Vinci Plus, that will explore Ma Venus in the, in the near future. But um, all this has been already said. So I need to invent something, uh, something different. Uh, let me start with this. We are living in very interesting times, um, in what I call accelerated times. Um, just picking some of the things that, uh, the topic and, um, that has been said before. Just think at uh, the time that spanned from uh, the first flying machine design, Leonardo, and the first man on the moon, or from that flying machine to the first, uh, sorry, to the first flight of the Wright brothers. From that first flight to the man on the moon, again, 
a short time, even shorter from the man on the moon where we are now. So private missions, uh, we have people who are selling uh, services uh, to national space agencies and, and so on. So it's a very accelerated time. And in particular, the, um, if you look at the back, um, I have been for many years the, the head of uh, the technology transfer department at the Italian Space Agency. And now I'm working as a space economy advisor for some uh, regional entities, public and private organizations. But uh, what I've seen is that we moved very quickly from what we call the space 1.0, that was the observation of the universe and the galaxy and the stars, the astronomy, let's say, side of space. Uh, we moved from there to space 2.0, the race to space, the Apollo missions. And then suddenly to space 3.0, the collaboration, the International Space Station, the master craft, the masterpiece of the human being is an object at 400 kilometers height, uh, at a speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour, is a huge, is a big, is the largest international cooperation in research uh, and science, is a huge laboratory on orbit. And then we are now maybe in space 4.0. Private entities, new, uh, let's say, uh, newcomers, um, wealthy people, billionaires, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, uh, Richard Branson, and so on. Um, but the paradigm maybe is, uh, is, a bit, uh, is a bit different because uh, what we are looking at now is not where we are now, but where, where we will go. So the space 5.0. And it seems that sometime we are very much looking back at Leonardo because it seems that we need now a new renaissance and it seems that uh, we need to maybe change priorities. Um, because we moved space 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, but basically we moved from uh, um, a, a competition to a collaboration, and maybe now we are back currently in a sort of competition. Think at uh, uh, the moon, think at uh, the new extended missions, think at um, Mars. But maybe, in my opinion, space 5.0 might be definitely different. Basically for three reasons. First, because uh, there is now a priority on technology transfer more than, than before, more than the past. A lot of technologies that we are using every day are coming from space. Um, we don't have time because I promise you to have take only five minutes. Maybe I'm already out of time. But uh, I can definitely state that uh, every day we use at least 25 to 30 times a space-derived technology, or we are using an application that is coming from space. I'll bet on that, maybe during the uh, cocktail. Um, and um, we are having more an open innovation approach. So space is getting more and more somehow open, cross-contamination, from space to non-space, but now also the other way around. We have a lot of technologies coming from, uh, from space, again, as said, used on Earth, but even from the other side. Um, like, for instance, uh, the new, uh, let, let's hope that it will uh, uh, become so, the, the ExoMars will uh, revamp again as a mission, but uh, drilling down on Mars to extract some um, um, terroir or to extract some, some little uh, piece of land and then bring it back. And, but the competencies are not with space, are with who is maybe working on oil and gas sector. Or the new concept of the spacesuits, those competencies are not with space, are with uh, who are uh, very much good in, in this kind of thing. Uh, maybe you have heard about Prada and Axiom, Axiom Space and Prada, they signed an agreement to design the new space suits. So there is this cross-contamination. So the next big thing will be, let's contaminate technology from different domains, so space and non-space and vice versa. In space domain, we say that uh, normally we have done spin out, which is from space down to Earth, but now we are doing spin in from Earth to space. That was number one. Number two is uh, the new incumbent. Not the wealthy people only, but the new countries. We have a race to the moon now. So um, if you see, there is um, uh, a number of countries that maybe were not that part of that space club. China, India, Japan, and then, of course, United States, and maybe in the future also uh, um, Russia and, and so on. But those new countries, those new incumbents, are um, even you know, applying new paradigms, like um, um, 
India has been the fourth country in the world to land on the moon, uh, but was also the fourth country in the world to land on Mars in 18 months, starting from scratch with a low-cost mission. And that is something that, you know, when, when we are talking about billions, is very, is something strange that, uh, you know, again, a space-faring nation has made this in, uh, in a low-cost uh, um, mode. Uh, but, and this was something that we discussed also with, uh, with Diana, um, half of the, more than half of the team that made possible to land the Chandrayaan mission, so Chandrayaan-3, so the mission to uh, um, land the, 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 the lander on moon from India, more than half of, of that team was made of female engineers. So this is also something that uh, I'm happy to say, but also I'm not that happy because uh, after 60, 70 years it's happening, it should have been uh, before, uh, it's becoming more, how can I say, diverse, balanced, more open. So this is something that is coming from the new incumbent country. Third point, last but not least, the new renaissance. Space 5.0 is definitely the new renaissance. Um, man is at the center, again, uh, but maybe, again, like the Leonardo times, but maybe something different. We don't have one genius only, but we have uh, we are in need of a plethora of um, new competencies, um, new engineers, um, new cross competencies. So this is also something that we have to, uh, to keep in mind. And of course, AI is at the edge of technology, so more and more new, new space, aerospace engineers are learning AI. Um, more and more in the science missions, in space missions, you have data scientists, and more and more you have even other competencies. Try to have a look, and then I will uh, um, uh, wrap up and start the Q&A session. Try to have a look at the job openings of uh, uh, SpaceX. You will see that it's a big chunk of uh, engineers, uh, communication specialists, and so on. But then you will see that you have uh, uh, physiologists, uh, agronomists, psychologists, and so on. So cross-contamination of competency. So coming to an end, sorry for having taken this, uh, this time, um, maybe we can say that we are moving from what is called space economy. That is not something new. Space economy has been there since ages. Uh, but maybe we are moving to a new space economy. So something very, very different. And then to a new, maybe, way of uh, looking at uh, uh, the holistic view of Leonardo. So the man at the center, but not only the man. Um, now maybe the space 5.0, so this new space economy should keep uh, into consideration that yes, we will go to Mars sooner or later, um, but uh, the man is at the center, but for the very first time now we have to think that not only the man, but also our planet, also the Earth is on the center. And if we do this, this is the, the key to have a new renaissance, also because at the very end of the day, this planet is the only flying machine, so closing the loop with Leonardo again, or the spaceship we have so far. So definitely we need to, uh, to keep this into, into account. So thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity of uh, uh, stealing you some, some time. I would open the Q&A session. I hope you have a lot of questions on uh, maybe Mona Lisa or on the Final Supper, I, I'll use this microphone, you can use that one, or on art and AI, or of course on the technology uh, to go to space and become maybe a multiplanetary society. So thanks a lot for being here. Um, I know it's a, maybe the most difficult task ever because we are, and this is not to put pressure on you, but we are the last panel before the uh, end of the conference uh, on a Friday late evening and the last obstacle to the uh, uh, networking cocktail. So uh, don't fear pressure, but we, we want to finish in, in time and have some networking. So questions, Can curiosity? Yes? No, no, you, you have to answer. I will, I'll pass, I'll pass. You answer.
Thank you. Um, I'm an attorney from New York, and I work uh, in social justice through the arts. I have to say, I think today's presentation, this presentation was the most interesting of the two days. Um, there seems to be a big disconnect between the promise of AI, um, the holistic unifying elements that this panel has spoken about, um, and on the other hand, the reality of our experience to date with, with social media, with Amazon, with um, Google, with Facebook. We don't think that we want to give another tool to those actors with their demonstrated history of not really leveraging the technology in the way that fulfills the promise that we're always talking about. Um, and then the other reality is in this kind of very elite gathering, we think of you know the, the best minds coming together and, and technology coming together to again, helping us re realize our full potential. But then we have the reality of um, governments with their very sovereign oriented, old fashioned mentality where uh, engineers from your country or engineers from my country have difficulty moving around. So um, it, I, I would hope that the people that gather at an event like this can help infuse um, the, the larger conversation around the, the, the real world that we're still living in when it comes to realizing the potential of yet another yeah, technological tool. Do you have a question for I mean, just, you know, <laughs> just a general observation, again, like thinking about, you know, the issue of immigration in Europe and, and America, you need engineers to achieve the potential of AI. So. You know, there are people here who can, like the gentleman from uh, Politecnico in Torino, Dove Vivo Adesso, um, Italy has a big problem with letting foreigners in to work and live. So, you know, maybe that could be one of the questions. Thank you so much. Who wants to take this very easy question? I didn't follow this question because it was a bit um, complex. Uh, who, who you want to answer your question, please? Mr. All of it's, an op it's an open discussion. Um, okay. Yes. Est-ce que je may I answer in French? Do you need me to answer in English? Okay, may I? Okay. Uh, la réponse, c'est que c'est le tout début. Il uh, y a des gens qui pensent, uh, je fais partie de cela, que l'arrivée de l'intelligence, ce qu'on appelle l'intelligence artificielle, hein, qui est en fait un, une addition de mille choses qui se combinent entre elles, il hein, n'y a pas une intelligence artificielle, euh, c'est la même révolution que l'invention du langage. Avec le langage, je peux transmettre euh, de la connaissance à d'autres, dans l'espace, dans le temps. Ça, sans langage, je ne peux pas le faire, quelle que soit la forme du langage. Mais pour avoir accès à cette connaissance, je dois aller la chercher. Depuis 5000 ans, plus ou moins, c'est comme ça. Avec l'intelligence artificielle, petit à petit, cette connaissance va venir à moi quand j'en aurai besoin, là où j'en aurai besoin, comme j'en aurai besoin. Et ça, c'est une révolution de même ordre que celle de la connaissance. C'est-à-dire que si on n'est pas éduqué, la connaissance, on n'y a pas accès. Si je ne suis pas éduqué, que je suis face à un système qui a un comportement autonome, l'intelligence artificielle, etc., alors le système peut m'éduquer quand et comment je peux. Très bien. L'écriture, ça fait 5000 ans qu'on l'a inventée. Grâce à l'écriture, on est ici aujourd'hui. Pas d'écriture, on ne serait pas là ici aujourd'hui. Rien de tout ça ne pourrait exister, ni même notre voyage jusqu'ici. C'était il y a 5000 ans. Nous, ça fait une grosse cinquantaine d'années qu'on fait des trucs avec le numérique. Donc on en est juste au tout début. Et c'est pour ça que c'est décevant, tel qu'on peut le voir aujourd'hui, et à mon avis, la principale réponse qu'on doit voir à l'esprit. Donc, ça veut dire, il ne faut pas avoir peur, il faut y aller, et il faut y aller, comme disait donc Leonardo, avec curiosité, ouverture et rigueur. Mais il faut y aller. Merci. Um, any other comment on, on this, or another question Yes Oh. In the meantime, in the meantime, just to give you an example for uh, the, because it's a very interesting question and uh, is an open uh, open discussion. Um, uh, a very little example. We are now, um, as an example of technology transfer from space to non-space, we will launch in Italy, so it will be unveiled um, maybe the second half of this year. Um, a robotic surgery school. Now. Uh, we have plenty of different uh, companies coming from uh, space robotics that uh, are funding this school 
And now they're fighting because the problem is that we can attract people, but we need to convince them to stay. So yes, university, and they have a lot of good, interesting programs. Um, even Politecnico di Torino, no? they have um, a lot of students from abroad. But then the problem is that uh, the vision is not that I have a student from abroad and then he learns or she learns about AI, robotics, and very deep tech or high-end technologies, and then going back to a country, I have a link with that country. No, the problem is that uh, we have shortage of resources. How can I keep the people, the people there? Then the immigration, this is another, is another story and is uh, part of maybe uh, geopolitics or, or other, other aspect. But there's also this other um, uh, way of you know, reading this, uh, looking at this problem. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I, I would like to, to go back to um, the augmented intelligence, my augmented intelligence, Florence. but yes. talking about the ambient uh, ambient intelligence. intelligence. But the thing is, the, the, you don't see a risk of having microchips in uh, your body, in your mind, in your brain. Or what, what was the point? Because when it is ambient, it's not a problem. But uh, as long as you start putting chips, microchips in your mind, in your mind, in your brain, sorry, or in your body, uh, I feel like we are not ethical anymore. So what, what, what's, what's your point of view on that? I assume you are not an employee of Neuralink. Uh, no? may, may I, I answer this question? Talking about augmented uh, reality doesn't mean have a chip in the brain. This is not exactly the right uh, translation. Augmented reality is a tool for mankind to do the beautiful work that we have, we can, you can see in the Last Supper, in the mm, boot uh, 45. You can see the beautiful Mona Lisa, and you can see a lot of examples that has been done in medicine. Doesn't mean putting a, a chip in our brain. By the way, sometimes it can happen. There have been already chirurgical operation to put a little chip in babies that they can't hear, and with this little chip inside, they can hear and learn to speak. So let's see how technology is used. The technology is available, and that's why the teaching, and I go back to the Leonardo da Vinci that I wanted to celebrate today, he said holistic view, men, women, plants, life, earth, all are at the same level and with the same respect. So it's something that maybe today we don't have anymore for our hearts, and also maybe we don't have enough for uh, different countries that they don't have access to artificial intelligence like we have. And also look in the future. Now, if you think about the space, at least the ones that there was the NASA and the Sujitsu from Russia. Now everyone can put uh, something on the space uh, and the space is a for the whole planet, is not personal of a company. Orange can put any telecom on the space. I don't think we, I think we need regulation and a type of respect in this race that is going to be the space. Yes, yeah, so, um, so, so you, want, uh, you want an holistic uh, regulation? You want holistic regulation? This is uh, more. <laughs> more. Regulation, more than regulation. Thank you. Yes. I just want uh, to give a word to space. We forget that we are already in space. We don't have to go to space to be in space. So, I mean, I'm working on a project where we are simulating because the important is that we have, like you say, we have to generate something that you have a feeling in between what you're staying with or what you're looking at. And you have to generate emotion to the people. And we have to not forget that technology, most of the time, is taking us away emotion, because or, or diverges emotion. So Leonardo da Vinci diverged the image to generate a specific emotion. We are diverging the image, our image of our trust and our values 
in different ways. Because through the technology, the use of technology has to be learned. It has, cannot be just you push a button and you do something, or you put a chip or another chip. I had a, a followed a, a case in between people who had put a chip on the chest, the other one in the leg. The other one made a chaos to American Airlines because they took him away the sensors, and there was a big chaos. So I mean, it's not a chip in the, what it is. It is we have already so many chips in ourselves that we have to discover. So we don't need extra electronics in ourselves. I think what we have to do, and that's what I'm trying to do, to visualize in different mediums. It's not necessarily only virtual reality or, or visuals. It can be sound, it can be vibration, it can be communication. Using these channels, you made before the question, who is doing and who is piloting us, the, the media, or who are, do we believe for? Do we look at space because all the communication is going in one direction or the other direction? Uh, this is a, the big mistake because we are already manipulated by all these chips, the invisible chips, which is communication and mass media production and so on and so on. So we have to be aware of this kind of things. So we have to go back to our origin and we have our origin very consistent and very solid. When we are a child, when we are looking at how we perceive the world, we are starting to put the first game, putting things together. I mean, that's, I remember my childhood, I'm quite older, older than you. So when we started to play, we had some objects and they move and we touch them, we sense them and we look at them. And we should be go back in the way that we make our sense of feeling. And I was just saying today several times that I was training for one year long, writing backwards like Leonardo da Vinci did. And that gave me the feeling that I had to talk to myself to do what I have to do. Because if I see and I learn what I do, the ABC and write it like I has learned as a pattern, I can do it automatically somehow. But if I have to translate this in a reverse direction and to write it anyhow and to be aware, it's like to speak another language in another way. So you have to translate it and makes it a latency. So we have to learn to deal in between us, our subconscious, the others in front of us and their subconscious. So we have to generate through the media, through the artificial intelligence, because that's another gimmick we are living with. I remember when Second Life came up, excuse me, that's maybe me, just throw it in the ground. Uh, it's that one is mine. Just, he will, they will then hang up, don't worry, so don't worry. This is what uh, n we are living with nowadays. Yes. Is the alarm when it is four minutes by the end of the day? Okay. It was the so alarm. I, I will make it very short, so I don't keep going. So if anyone has to say something, but I think we have to generate an awareness. So I was coming from traditional media. I painted, I sculpted, and so on. And then I went to the jungle in Amazonas. I was painting in, in German style, a lot of impression and a lot of emotion, a lot of colors, oil paint, and thick things. And I went to the jungle in the Amazonas. I came back, I changed totally the style. I became, I used only the primer colors on a simple canvas, white and black was for me the importance. And I started totally to see the world in a different way. I divide up spaces and I, in the spaces I located things to organize myself because it's all an organization. Nature is so organized. We should look more to nature like Neuro da Vinci did. He looked at nature, observed it, transmit it and made out his mechanism, whatever. And we think we have to not get tricked by technology. I'm using the highest technology as I can possibly, but that's just like I use a car. I can use a Tesla, I can use a Mercedes, I can use a Fiat Cinquecento or whatever. But I want to go to the destination. And this is what we don't have to forget with all this artificiality. So we are already too artificialized in our mind and we don't have to expect another artificialization. So that's what is. Do you have anything to say about Florent, one more question. Maybe we have time for the last one. Yes, and then if you want to continue conversation on ethics and regulation and so on, we are here, uh, I guess, afterwards. So we have two minutes left if you want to be German and super sharp. Okay, so if you want to go to the cocktail, uh, so then we have two minutes left. Otherwise, we... I'll try to be as brief as possible. Okay. Um, so... Uh, Technology is, in general, I, I think, something that's embedded in how we act as humans and it influences us. And to me, artificial intelligence is particularly fascinating because it's, it's giving us the chance to ask us what makes us human, given that it can apparently mimic many of the things that we can do. And thinking about art, for example, thinking about generative AI, where 
we see that, in a way, technology can create new content, given that it's taken from a lot of training data, so we know where it comes from, but you know, it's, it's creating something original and it's creating something new. I was wondering uh, how you see this uh, influencing, in general, the uh, art scene and what an artist does. So where's uh, the, the creativity and uh, what's going to be uh, human creativity when you can actually generate new content that has something original? So if you have an opinion on this, uh, I would love to hear it. And thank you. OK. And I would also, if so this is for the artist. Right? Okay. And uh, okay. So then I would also involve maybe with a little add on on the, the on the question. Also Professor Genta in uh, in extending the question in is AI helping also in uh, engineering creativity, so in designing new machines. You showed us, you know, the rover and so on. So let's start with the creative and then let's go to the more, you know, based uh, feet on earth guy here. Florent. The way I'm thinking about what you're talking about is, as an artist, I'm interested to express something. I am interested to express something. I don't care about what a machine can express. Uh, ChatGPT and all these uh, generative AI are useful because when I want to, to have a flux of something which is expressed and uh, reacting to the situation, for example, a, generative, a generator is useful. But my concern and my interest is to control the generating. I'm not uh, interested in what happened exactly at this moment, but how it's controlled. So it means the same work, you know, it's the same work uh, as usual. And it's not because I have a generator, uh, which is an additional tool, as you said. Uh, okay, I get it, I take it, I need it, you know, for example. But uh, I'm really not interested about what a machine can generate, what, what machines think. And so it means that we will never support the appearance of a machine that expresses for itself. We are not interested in what a machine expresses, except when a machine expresses the author, point of view, or desire, and so on. So it's a, I, I think for me, it's as simple as that. What is complicated? It's to know how to control this expression, this flux of expression. That's what is complicated to, to do. And that's what we are working on. It's a new semiology at the disposal of the authors and all the creators, but specifically, let's say, the artists, the authors. And we have to establish this, uh, to understand which is this uh, the semiology of this system of expression, and then to use it, and then to continue to express. For me, it's as complicated and as simple as that. Thank you. Thank you. Franz? I just want to add something. I mean, there is art with the small A and the art with the capital E. There is art of the true mission of communicating something, and there is the art of marketing. Okay? So there is also a big division in between. Who is how, nowadays famous? The one who knows how to be an entrepreneur or how to be a marketing, good marketing in the back. So this is the way. It, the dangerous part is that we are getting very confused. But we are already very confused after Duchamp, that he was opening the possibility that everybody can make art and everything can be art. Now it's the difference to make a careful vision of what is art. We don't have to say that what the generator is making or these new tools are bringing up. This is a good use to do, to stimulate our creativity with things that you never have maybe thought before because you put together things that you don't, your brain doesn't connect because we are not connected all the time. So we have patterns, we have prejudice, and we are living a life daily which is done by many issues that is not ourselves by ourselves. So this is when art is to be very careful. So I, I, was, I don't call myself as an artist. I call myself sometimes a creative when I bring up a good idea. If not, I'm just a common as anyone else. So I, I just use the medium to tr express what I get from the perception from you, from you, from everybody, from the space and whatever. And I try to translate this into a medium that communicates something which gives emotion and gives something that you have a value that you can carry on and it makes you think in what is you. Okay, so this is when it becomes for me an artistical element because it becomes a powerful 
tool to communicate in between the one who look at it and the one perceiving it and the one who does it. So the one who does it is basically the one who does it, but that's it. So the artist is somehow should be a good craftsman and should be a good philosopher and putting that together and work for the vision and the mission which we are living daily and the challenges we have. Thank you. Professor Genta. Okay. Well, first, uh, I think that uh, artificial intelligence is just uh, a tool and uh, the creative part is the human that put into the work. His uh, living Mona Lisa is not made by an artificial intelligence, it's made by an artist. And uh, the artist controls everything. In engineering, okay, engineering is changed in the last, uh, we can say, 40 years, 50 years, a lot by the instrument we have. Because instruments are instruments, okay, but uh, the, how we use the instrument changes also our way of thinking. But this is a process that went on always. For example, Leonardo, was, when was conceiving a machine, he was thinking it as a three-dimensional object and was depicting it like an astronometry or a perspective. Later, they realized that it was impossible to do this with enough precision, and so, was invented projective geometry. And uh, we started thinking not more in three-dimensional thinking, but uh, on a flat plane, projecting our object in various planes. And this allowed us to learn how to increase precision, but we lost the three-dimensional thinking. Now, with 3D CAD, we have put together the two worlds. We have closed the cycle. Now, the engineer, when thinks of a part, thinks to a three-dimensional object again, like Leonardo did. But the instrument allows us to put in enough precision in our three-dimensional thinking. So, Instruments are instruments. Humans are using instruments, but using certain instruments change the way in which we think. And there is nothing to do about that. But this is fortunately because we couldn't, for example, exploit 3D printing if we don't think the object in 3D. And uh, this can be done only by three-dimensional CAD. And so artificial intelligence will go beyond that, will create new instruments. And uh, we will use these new instruments, uh, learning by using them, and changing again the way in which we design objects. And we will design objects that before couldn't be designed. For example, if you print, 3D print with metal 3D printing that is additive manufacturing to be more precise, a rocket engine, you can make the rocket engine with two or three pieces in, instead of 200 pieces. And NASA does that now, X, SpaceX does that now. And they will come out with much efficient, much more efficient, and much lighter rocket engines. And this will allow, for example, to build one stage to orbit launchers. And this will change again completely everything. So we are going to use these new instruments. And it's important that the specialists on AI develop these new instruments so that engineers can use them to create 
we can say new engineering, okay, let's say it like that, but a different way to do things. And also art, perhaps, you will do art in a different way. I have seen, I have a friend who is a space painter and paints very nice space environments on the computer. This is something that before computers couldn't be done. So computer art is a new form of art, but it's always the artist who do that, not the AI. Okay, thank you so much. I don't know, Diana, if you want the very final remarks. Thank you very much for all of you. If there is a last question, maybe we answer when we meet outside. Thank mm. you so much. Thank you. And Leonardo is still here. It is very modern. Thank you.